There have been a lot of creepy men over the course of history. Men have been responsible for a lot of things history would rather forget. Pretty much all the wars, the colonization of pretty much anywhere, the XFL. You name it, men have probably helped make it worse. Of course, men have done some pretty great things too. Penicillin, the Buddha's Eightfold Path, and the Beatles are just a few that come to mind. But for now, we're going to focus on the weird and the creepy. So here are some of the creepiest men throughout history. Rasputin Grigory Rasputin was probably one of the creepiest holy men in history. He reportedly had a stare that could hypnotize you into doing all kinds of unsavory things. He was a self-proclaimed healer with marginal credibility. He loved to host crazy intimate group parties and was accused of forcing himself on multiple women and had an unsettling love for the Russian Tsar's daughters. Rasputin was born to a poor family in a small village in Siberia in 1869. By 1903, he'd made his way to St. Petersburg, where he began to build his reputation as a mystic and a holy man. He eventually weaseled his way into the inner circle of Tsar Nicholas II, and particularly his wife, Tsarina Alexandra. He had reportedly healed their son, Alexei, who was suffering from hemophilia. His medicinal exploits soon cozied him up to the Tsar's wife, and from then on, he was an influential advisor in the royal court. But his advice shouldn't have been taken so religiously by the Tsar and his wife. He was a shady character with questionable motives, and calling him creepy, well, honestly, is an understatement. Of the many things strange about Rasputin, one of the strangest might have been his ideas surrounding sin. He believed in a concept called repentance through sinning, which encouraged people to engage in sinful behavior as a way of purging their sins. Now, according to this belief, People could only truly repent for their sins by committing more sins, which would ultimately lead them to a state of grace. <laughs> Wrong. Rasputin believed that engaging in sinful behavior was a way of testing your faith and proving your devotion to God. He reportedly encouraged people to go a bit buck wild and encouraged drinking, gambling, and a whole lot of other things. His sin to rid yourself of sin mantra didn't go down very well with many Russian aristocrats and politicians. Many people viewed Rasputin as a charlatan and a heretic, and his unorthodox religious beliefs contributed to his reputation as a dangerous and manipulative figure. Then there was the fact that he was far too touchy-feely with the royal children, particularly the Tsar's daughters Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia. He apparently referred to them as his little chicks and sweets. Yeah, very creepy. And there are tons of stories about how he would spend time playing games with them and exchanging letters back and forth. Some have even suggested he was basically a kind of surrogate father to the girls. But whether this was just a friendly relationship or whether it descended into something darker is up for debate. One of the royal nannies was reportedly horrified when she found Rasputin in the royal nursery when the women were in their nightgowns. And although he apparently had the royal go-ahead to be there, it's still not a good look. In addition to his creepy behavior towards the royal daughters and accusations of forced intimacy with their nannies, Grigory Rasputin was also known for his intense and penetrating gaze. Some people thought it had a hypnotic quality that could mesmerize others and make them do his bidding. Rasputin reportedly used his gaze to exert a powerful influence over people, particularly women, who were often drawn to him. One example of Rasputin's creepy hypnotic stare was described in the memoirs of a guy named Felix Yusupov, a Russian aristocrat who was involved in Rasputin's death. According to Yusupov, he invited Rasputin to his palace and offered him cakes and wine that had been laced with cyanide. But despite consuming a large amount of poison, Rasputin didn't seem to be affected. Instead, he reportedly looked at Yusupov with a strange and terrible expression and began to speak to him in a low, creepy voice. Yusupov later wrote that he felt as though he was under Rasputin's spell and couldn't resist his influence. So, combine a hypnotic stare with questionable morals and a belief that in order to get rid of sin, you have to sin more, and you have a recipe for one of history's creepiest men. Vlad the Impaler Vlad III, commonly known as Vlad the Impaler, or Vlad Dracula, was the 15th century ruler of Wallachia in present-day Romania. He was reportedly the inspiration behind Bram Stoker's Dracula character, and just like the character, he was extremely creepy. So creepy that he made a vampire telling you he wants to drink your blood look more like a guy at a bar asking for a beer. 
True to his name, Vlad had a penchant for puncturing because apparently the act can also be used as a noun. Back in the day, the act involved turning someone into a kebab and not the kind you find at a barbecue. It involved a sharp steak being inserted through the unfortunate puncturee's body, typically from the buttocks and out through the mouth or torso. It was an excruciating, painful, and slow way to go. Vlad loved it. Puncturing was his go-to move, his Mortal Kombat special, number one on his tool belt. It not only ended the lives of whoever he didn't like, it also served as a psychological weapon to intimidate his enemies and make sure no one tried anything funny. Vlad's use of puncturing reached horrifying proportions during his rule. According to historical accounts, he punctured tens of thousands of people, political rivals, captured soldiers, innocent civilians. No one was immune to his macabre tendencies. There are even accounts that say he enjoyed dining amidst a forest of punctured victims. I wonder what he ate. Then again, I don't wonder what he ate. Kebabs? <laughs> I know. Sorry. So let's get into the forest. Vlad's Forest of the Impaled, to be specific. During the siege of the city of Targotsvishche, Vlad ordered the puncturing of thousands of captured Ottoman soldiers. It said that when they saw the gruesome spectacle, the Ottoman Sultan and his army were so horrified that they retreated. Vlad the Impaler's reputation for cruelty and sadism extended beyond mere punishment. He was known to use other nasty methods to dispatch those who displeased him. One weird one was placing golden cups in public spaces to test the honesty of his subjects. If a cup went missing, he would punish the entire community. The Original Dr. Frankenstein Johann Conrad Dippel is said to be the inspiration for Dr. Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's famous novel, and it's probably true. Dippel was born in the German town of Castle Frankenstein in 1673, and he went on to become a much madder scientist than Shelley's fictional doctor ever was. Dippel was an all-around weird guy. He was really into alchemy and spent a good part of his career trying to discover the Philosopher's Stone, a mythical substance said to be capable of turning base metals into gold and silver. He also conducted many unsavory experiments with animals and human bodies, leading to rumors that he was a grave robber and that he performed sketchy experiments on living subjects. Dippel even claimed to have created a potion that could grant immortality. But given that he's dead now, maybe it wasn't as effective as he'd hoped. Dippel also had a turbulent career as a theologian. He was expelled from several universities for his unorthodox beliefs, including the idea that the soul wasn't immortal and that Satan wasn't a literal being but rather a state of mind. He also believed in predestination, and all of these combined heretical stances made him a pretty unpopular Christian. One of Dippel's most infamous claims was that he could perform soul transplants on dead bodies. He believed that the soul was a physical substance that could be extracted from the body and then implanted into another body, effectively transferring the consciousness and personality of one individual to another. <laughs> yeah, that's nuts. Dippel reportedly conducted experiments on animals to test his theory of soul transplants. During his experiments, he tried to extract the souls of dogs and transfer them into other animals, like sheep and goats. It's unclear how successful these experiments were or how exactly they were even carried out. I mean, will your dog start meowing and develop a taste for mice? The English Hangman You think one of the most prolific hangmen the world has ever known would be a pretty ruthless guy, and he certainly was, but maybe, just maybe, this next creepy dude saw the error in his ways. Albert Pierpoint was an English hangman whose hanging career spanned 25 years, from 1931 to 1956. Pierpoint carried out somewhere between 435 to 600 state-sanctioned punishments over the years, probably more than the guest list to a party hosted by P. Diddy. Born on March 30, 1905 in Clayton, West Yorkshire, Pierpoint came from a family with a long-standing tradition of hangmen because that was apparently a thing. His father, Henry Pierpoint, and Uncle Thomas Pierpoint were also hangmen. Albert Pierpoint initially worked as a grocery delivery man, but eventually followed in his family's footsteps, helping out his uncle in several punishments before becoming a hangman himself. Pierpoint was known for his efficiency and professionalism during the killing process. He believed in carrying out his duty swiftly and with precision. He was no monster and took pride in giving the people deemed too alive for society a quick and humane appointment with whatever afterlife they thought they might or might not be heading for. Pierpoint was apparently quite good at judging distances and developed a technique of accurately measuring the length of the drop needed for each person at the gallows, taking into account their height, their weight, to make sure their job was done with as little screaming as possible. Now, throughout his prolific career, Pierpoint ended the lives of all types, murderers, spies, war criminals, you name it, he hung it. 
Some of its most notable cases included the killing of Timothy Evans in 1950, who was wrongly convicted of taking the life of his daughter, and Ruth Ellis in 1955, the last woman to meet the gallows in the UK. Pierpoint did his best to maintain an air of professionalism during his two and a half decades as a hangman, but the emotional toll of his job was unavoidable. After the killing of a convict named James Inglis in 1951, Pierpoint started to question the morality of capital punishment. He became an advocate for the abolition of the death penalty and resigned from his post in 1956. Following his retirement, Pierpoint wrote an autobiography titled Executioner Pierpoint. He wrote and argued that the death penalty served no purpose and called for its abolition. His views had a pretty big impact on public opinion. I mean, think about it. He had an expert opinion. The death penalty was abolished a little over a decade later in 1965. Dr. Lobotomy Drill a hole in your head, it'll make you better, they said. You think something as crude as literally taking an ice pick to someone's skull would be something reserved for the medical science of the Ice Age, or at least the Dark Ages. <laughs> but no, it happened less than a hundred years ago, and there's one guy responsible for popularizing the horrible technique. Let's call him Dr. Lobotomy. Walter Jackson Freeman II. An American neurologist and psychiatrist was a man on a mission, and the mission wasn't a very noble one. He thought that lobotomies were the way to go when it came to treating mental illness of all kinds, and like the procedure itself, his methods were crude and ethically questionable. Freeman, along with his colleague James W. Watts, modified the original lobotomy technique developed by a Portuguese neurologist named Egis Moniz. They developed a procedure called the transordable lobotomy, or ice pick lobotomy. It involved inserting a thin metal instrument that looked too much like an ice pick through the eye socket and into the brain to section off neural connections to the prefrontal cortex. One of the reasons Freeman's lobotomy procedure gained popularity was the fact that it was touted as a potential treatment for a whole range of mental disorders, including psychosis susceptibility syndrome, depression, and anxiety. Freeman claimed that the procedure could alleviate symptoms and restore patients' functionality. This belief, coupled with a lack of effective alternatives at the time, led to a surge in the use of lobotomies. Freeman's approach to performing lobotomies was marked by speed and quantity over careful consideration and individualized treatment. He often performed lobotomies in hospital basements, traveling across the United States in his, and I'm not making this up, lobotomobile to reach different psych wards and medical institutions. His technique involved minimal pre-op evaluation and relied on a brute force approach, driving the instrument through the eye socket without anesthesia and using a mallet to tap into place. Freeman and his lobotomobile crisscrossed the country for years. He performed over 3,400 lobotomies. People with depression, anxiety, OCD, and just about anything else that could be regarded as out of the ordinary in terms of psychological behavior. His motto was apparently, lobotomy gets them home. It seems like he really thought he was doing noble work, but he ended up going down in history as a champion of what basically amounted to punishment. Genghis Khan Here we are with Genghis Khan. He was the father of what would become the largest contiguous land empire in the history of the world, and he was also a father to so many children that an estimated 1 in 200 people today are descended from him. Genghis Khan was a lot of things. He was a brilliant military strategist, a shrewd negotiator. He knew how to intimidate his enemies and win battles despite having fewer men. He also knew the value of tolerance. He would famously let his defeated enemies practice whatever religion they wanted. This way, many of them would come over to his side and help him defeat the next enemy up in the always rotating Rolodex of enemies he was battling across Asia, Eastern Europe, and down into Arabia. But in many ways, Genghis Khan was a monster. We're not sure exactly how many people died either directly by his sword or indirectly thanks to his orders, but when you take into account a range of factors, some scholars estimate the number could be as high as 40 million. He was able to build his and the Mongol reputation by being absolutely ruthless if an enemy refused to surrender or disrespected him in any way. If the great Khan did feel disrespected, then he would often level the entire city of whatever leader doled out the disrespect. In the early 13th century, during the Mongol invasion of the Khorasmian Empire, the city of Urgench was in his crosshairs. At the time, Urgench was one of the largest and wealthiest cities in the empire. After the governor of Urgench, a guy named Analchuk, killed a Mongol trade delegation and refused to submit to Mongol rule, Genghis Khan sent his armies to besiege the city. 
The siege lasted for a few months, during which time the Mongols launched several unsuccessful attacks on the city. Eventually, the Mongols broke through the city's walls and launched a full-scale assault. They then ran rampant through the streets, taking out nearly all of the city's defenders and civilians. They then set fire to the city and destroyed all of its buildings, leaving only rubble and ash. The destruction of Urgench was seen as a warning to other cities in the region not to resist Mongol rule. And it is estimated that the population of the city was reduced from around 50,000 to as few as 1,000 after the Mongols were through with it. Aside from burning down entire cities, Genghis Khan also had many, many concubines. A lot of those women were stolen from conquered cities and empires. Yet while he was no doubt involved in a whole lot of human death and suffering, there were certain aspects of the Great Khan that were not actually so bad compared to other leaders of his time. Genghis was actually somewhat progressive in how he treated women. He encouraged the education of women and even appointed women to high-ranking positions in his court. Shiro Ishii Shiro Ishii was a Japanese microbiologist, medical officer, and eventual Surgeon General of Japan during World War II. And he's credited with building perhaps the deadliest lab in history and getting away with it. Ishii was apparently a problem from a young age. He exhibited violent tendencies and was reportedly expelled from school for harming a classmate with a sword. Yeah, a whole sword! He later attended a different school and went on to study medicine at Kyoto Imperial University. During his studies, he reportedly became interested in the military applications of medicine. Ishii eventually became the director of the infamous Unit 731, a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit attached to the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II. Ishii and his team carried out horrific experiments on people who had been deemed disposable by the Japanese military, such as Chinese, Korean, and Russian prisoners of war. The unit was also not averse to capturing local civilians and bringing them into the unit's facilities. Some of the experiments that Ishii oversaw included exposing prisoners to infectious diseases like bubonic and anthrax in order to study their symptoms and develop vaccines. He was also interested in testing the effects of extreme temperatures on the human body and dissecting people alive without any anesthesia at all. Ishii also developed a form of the bubonic disease that could be delivered via bombs or fleas, and he tested this weapon on prisoners and civilians too, often tying them up, then infecting them and sitting back and seeing what happened. Ishii very much wanted to develop an effective and deadly biological weapon, and many of his experiments were aimed at creating bombs and aerosols that could spread diseases over large areas. Ishii's team also engaged in brutal forms of punishment, such as being set on fire or subjected to high-pressure chambers until their eyes popped out. Some prisoners were subjected to extreme cold or heat or had limbs amputated without anesthesia in order to study the effects of trauma on the body. After the war, Ishii was granted immunity in exchange for providing the United States with his research data, and he went on to live a relatively comfortable life in Japan until he died in 1959. The horrific experiments carried out by Ishii and his team at Unit 731 were largely unknown to the public until the 1980s when information about their activities started getting declassified. Even today, the full extent of the atrocities committed by Unit 731 remains unknown since many of the records were destroyed by the Japanese government after the war. Prince Albert and Dirty Birdie Next up in our installment of history's creepiest men, we have the one-two punch of Victorian England's weirdest royals. Victorian England was a strange time. The prim and proper facade that society was built on at the time often had a creepy, seedy underbelly. It's usually what happens when basic biological urges and feelings are suppressed and replaced by polished cutlery and curtsies. When you make something illegal or taboo, it often just goes underground, morphs, gets weirder and more dangerous, and then soon you have Al Capone. The two royals we're about to discuss are Prince Albert and Edward VII, nicknamed Bertie. Prince Albert was Queen Victoria's husband slash cousin, and Bertie was the Queen's son and eventual successor. Let's start with Albert. By all accounts, Albert and Victoria had a very loving relationship. They would write love letters to each other and even had a lock on their summer home that could be latched from the bedside. But Prince Albert also reportedly had a piercing on his member of parliament. Now the point of the piercing was apparently to attach his member to his leg to avoid the unsightly bulge that was considered unfashionable in the Victorian era. Others have speculated that it was to correct a condition called Peyronie's disease, which causes pain when a man, you know, gets worked up, and the piercing could have been an attempt to correct it. Prince Albert's ring remains in the realm of rumor, though. 
But it hasn't stopped the style from taking on his name. Go into a tattoo and piercing shop and ask for Prince Albert, and you'll either be told to leave or told to pull your pants down. And by the way, good luck with that. Let's move on to Queen Victoria's son, Bertie. Bertie had a reputation for being a womanizer throughout his life, which was a life marked by excess and lots and lots of affairs. He was married to Princess Alexandra of Denmark, and although they had a seemingly decent marriage, he continued to sleep around. A lot. It's estimated that he had affairs with as many as 55 women during his lifetime. At one point, he became particularly obsessed with the actress Lily Langtry. He pursued her relentlessly, even attending her performances night after night and sending her extravagant gifts. Langtry eventually gave in to his advances and they began a relationship which lasted for several years. Edward also had a long-term affair with Alice Keppel, the great-grandmother of the Duchess of Cornwall, Camilla Parker Bowles. Bertie obviously loved to party. He would often throw wild ones that lasted for days and he would partake in all sorts of bacchanalian activities. His behavior was looked down upon and considered scandalous by many and it was rumored that his mother, the Queen, was less than pleased. She was so ashamed of her son. Actually, she named him her heir and he became the next King of England. Imagine that. Maximilian Robespierre Next up, we have a guy who may have started off his political career with good intentions, but by the time he was killed, had either ordered or been a key part of the deaths of nearly 40,000 people. It's estimated that as many as 40,000 people were killed during the Reign of Terror, a period of violence and political repression during the French Revolution from 1793 to 1794. Many more were imprisoned or died in custody, and countless others were killed or injured in the fighting that took place during the Revolution. Maximilian Robespierre was one of the most prominent figures of the Reign of Terror and played a central role in the violence and repression that characterized the period. He was a key member of the Committee of Public Safety, the governing body that oversaw the terror, and so Robespierre was the man overseeing the arrest and the sentence death of thousands of people who were deemed counter-revolutionary or otherwise opposed to the revolution. Robespierre, for sure, was a bit of a zealot. He believed in the absolute purity of the revolution and thought that violence and terror were the best ways to achieve its goals. Under Robespierre's leadership, the Committee for Public Safety instituted a policy of mass arrest and punishments targeting anyone who was suspected of opposing the revolution or harboring counter-revolutionary sentiments. Many of those who were targeted were innocent or had only minor connections to any real anti-revolutionary activities. But Robespierre and his allies figured that persecuting anyone and everyone who might have the tiniest bit of doubt was necessary to protect the revolution from its enemies. Robespierre was also a sickly-looking little man who was a hypochondriac obsessed with his health. He only wore simple, plain clothing, and there were rumors that he was either celibate or had some strange fetishes that he didn't want anyone to know about. And as the revolution progressed, Robespierre became more paranoid than someone who accidentally swallowed a grass-filled gummy and then called the cops on himself. As the reign of terror reached its height, he became convinced that there were enemies of the revolution lurking everywhere and that anyone who didn't share his extreme views or follow his strict code of revolutionary purity was a potential threat to the state. Robespierre's paranoia led to an increasing suspicion of his fellow members of the Committee of Public Safety. Now, despite being one of the most powerful members of the committee, Robespierre became increasingly convinced that his colleagues were plotting against him and that they were secretly working to undermine the revolution. One of the most dramatic examples of Robespierre's paranoia came in the days leading up to his downfall in July of 1794. In a speech to the National Convention, Robespierre accused several of his colleagues of being traitors, pointing fingers and claiming that they were secretly plotting against him and the revolution. His accusations were met with jeers and boos, though, and he was eventually arrested and punished along with several of his supporters. While we're on the topic of the French Revolution, let's get into another Frenchman who helped popularize the revolution's go-to way to end the lives of those who were against it, Joseph Ignace Guillotine. Guillotine was a particularly creepy person as far as people go, but his invention was used to unhead so many people during the French Revolution that we can't mention Robespierre and the Reign of Terror without giving a nod to Mr. Guillotine. One of the greatest ironies of the whole story might be that the guy who invented the guillotine was actually opposed to the death penalty. Well, he didn't actually invent the guillotine. Guillotine the man actually proposed that the French government figure out a cool new way to punish people. A team of engineers then whipped up the design we now associate with the guillotine and voila, a new way to remove the heads as of many political dissidents as your government heart desires. 
Guillotine studied medicine in Paris before becoming a respected physician and was eventually appointed to the Faculty of Medicine in Paris in 1784. As a member of the National Assembly during the French Revolution, Guillotine became a strong advocate for social and political reforms, including the abolition of the death penalty. While that ideal was a tough sell to the French government, he figured he could at least try to make the act of punishment itself a bit less painful. Still though, his proposal to alleviate the pain of others was a tough sell, and he faced a lot of opposition as he was trying to get a new killing method pushed through, but he was eventually successful. The first guillotine was constructed in 1792, and it was quickly adopted as the official method in France. In addition to his infamous neck-splitting device, Guillotine had another particularly creepy aspect to his career. While he was against the death penalty, he was very much for being able to experiment on criminals, both dead and alive. As a medical doctor, Guillotine believed that the bodies of dead criminals could be used for scientific research and medical education. He argued that the use of these bodies could benefit society by advancing medical knowledge and improving medical care. In the 18th century, the bodies of deceased criminals were often used for examination and other medical experiments, but the practice was often looked down upon and considered ungodly. Guillotine was one of the leading proponents of the use of these bodies, and he argued that the benefits of scientific research outweighed any concerns about the dignity of the deceased, and that wasn't all. He thought that instead of being sent to death, which in his opinion was cruel and unusual punishment, Convicted criminals should instead be subjects for medical experimentation that could result in some discovery or scientific breakthrough. There have been a lot of creepy men throughout history, and you know what? We certainly didn't have time to get to all of them. Who else do you want to know about? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.